Amen. I'm coming back to the topic of Lordship Salvation. And uh, we already talked about the hypocrisy of Lordship Salvation. And then I began talking about the ignorance of the Lordship Salvation crowd, ignorance towards repentance, and what the Bible means about that. We talked about last, last time we went through this, uh, the ignorance concerning the new creature and some of the verses that were used for that. Ignorance about what it means to have faith in Christ, and both of those things are going to come up a little bit today as well. In fact, I think that we'll move on. I might do one more sermon on Lordship Salvation, uh, dealing with the fruit from the salvation, uh, I mean, Lordship Salvation crowd. But I think as far as the ignorance of salvation, I mean, I just, a lot of the verses that are going to be used the rest of the, this, uh, uh, this article, which I'm addressing is just going to be repetitious. They're going to be repeating a lot of things that we've already talked about, so I think it would be useless to, to continue that. But I want to read this paragraph from this article, and just for a reminder, the article came from uh, uh, gotquestions.org, and the guy's name, I finally looked it up, S. Michael Hoodman, or uh, Shea Hoodman is, uh, is what the S stands for. And I looked into him a little bit. He graduated actually in Kansas City, Missouri from uh, Calvary Theological Seminary. Don't even know anything about that. And he references in the article John MacArthur, and I know he, uh, he believes a lot like, uh, like that. And so in the article that I've been reading, he's pointing out the differences between Lordship Salvation versus Easy Believism, which is what he would call us, no doubt. And, uh, and I also shared with some people some resistance that, that I've had some criticism that I've had about the way that we do soul winning and people calling us easy believism. And one even went so far as to say we're making children uh, twofold, the, chil the children of hell, which I just think is ridiculous. And so, uh, uh, so this is why it became important to me. Then another person uh, just asked online, uh, just messaged me and said, you know, do you know any sermons on Lordship Salvation? Because I'm kind of dealing with that right now. So I just felt like the Lord would have me to deal with that. And as I went through this article, I'm just reading this stuff thinking, man, that's exactly what I've heard people, scriptures that people have quoted to me and, and things, uh, the same kind of reasoning that people have used to kind of show me some of these same uh, philosophies and say where, where we're wrong and we don't, repeat, we don't uh, preach the repentance of sins for salvation and all that. And so we've just been going through all these verses and addressing them. And I want to read this next paragraph from this article. And he revisits this concept to some degree of the inner man. Uh, but this, uh, this place, he says, the, let me read the paragraph, then I'll break it down to you. He says, true faith always produces a changed life. And he quotes uh, or references 2 Corinthians 5 again. He says, the inner person is transformed by the Holy Spirit. I think there's a lack of an understanding of what the inner person is right there is what I think. He says, and the Christian has a new nature. Those uh, with genuine faith, and listen to this. Those with genuine faith, those who are submitted to the Lordship of Christ, follow Jesus, love their brothers, obey God's commandments, do the will of God, abide in His Word, keep God's Word, do good works, and continue in the faith. Salvation is not adding, to, uh, adding Jesus to a pantheon of one's idols. It is a wholesale destruction of the idols with Jesus reigning supreme. So kind of throws that like a straw man argument there at the end saying like, you can't just add Jesus to a pantheon of one's idols. Nobody ever said you could, <laughs> right? But, uh, but basically he's going through and, 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 and he gives this list of things that a saved person, the fruit that's naturally going to come from a saved person is basically what he's saying. And he says, if you are saved, how did he say it? He said, if a person is genuine if those with genuine faith those who are submit he defines what genuine faith is those who are submitted to the lordship of christ then those people these things will uh will, will they will produce these things and so i want to break those down a little bit uh he says there uh, in the very beginning of that section, like I said, he, he quotes 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 17 again, where it talks about uh, all things are become new. You know, you're a new creature in Christ when you get saved. All things become new. My thinking on that would be, yeah, well, that new has to do with that inner man, the spiritual man, right? This flesh doesn't, all, doesn't become all new. 
Uh, maybe, maybe now we can kind of tap into that spirit and remind ourselves that we're dead and with Christ. And so we can try to walk in the new man. But this body didn't change. This body still has to die. It didn't, re- it didn't uh, cease to be corrupt. Okay, so, so naturally the, we're still going to struggle between the new man and the old man. The Bible makes that very clear. And he says, uh, he also refers to Galatians chapter 2. Let's look at there. At Galatians chapter 2. Before I give this list of the fruit that he says that genuine faith will produce, he says that the inner person is transformed by the Holy Spirit. And then he says, uh, Galatians 2, verse 20. Galatians 2, 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, uh, it, I'm sorry, the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's a great verse, isn't it? Amen. I mean, every word of the, in the Bible is great. He uses this, and it's a great verse for Christians to say, look, this is the way I need to live. My, I give my life to Christ, you know, and everything that's in me is Christ. And this is Paul giving his testimony. Notice, this is Paul giving his testimony. He's not saying here that this is going to happen to everybody that gets saved. In fact, what's so ridiculous about him using Galatians 2 is, do you know the context of Galatians? You know what Galatians, look at Galatians 1 here. He says, in verse 6, I marvel, he's talking to the church at Galatia, and he says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Because all of a sudden, these guys that believed that they couldn't do anything to earn salvation, and they could, all they could do is just trust Christ and what he did, all of a sudden they're going back to the law and saying, whoa, you've got to be circumcised, you've got to do all these things. And he says, what in the world? You know, I marvel that you're so soon removed from that. Look at chapter 3. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only what I learn of you, receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain? If it be yet in vain, he therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit... That worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. <laughs> I mean, how could you use Galatians 2 to preach a lordship salvation? It seems so ridiculous. I don't even know if he read the rest of that verse. And then he also says, uh, here uh, he says, uh, let me see, he says, and the Christian has a new nature. Well, amen. And he quotes Romans 6 again, which we looked at before, but let's go there again. Romans 6. I believe we have a new nature. The inner man is is born born again, and and he's, all things are new. But obviously that's not what Lordship Salvation is teaching. Romans 6, 6 says this, uh, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and henceforth we should not serve sin. Amen. We shouldn't serve sin. (laughs) But he's not saying, and you just absolutely will no longer serve sin. No, he's saying, I I need to remind you of this. You shouldn't serve sin. Uh, You know, and so uh, look at verse 11 of the same chapter. Likewise, look at this word, reckon. I know that's not a word we use a lot today unless we live in the, <laughs> in the South or something, but reckon ye also yourself to be dead indeed unto Christ, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's something that we need to remind ourselves. You know, every day we got to remind ourselves that we're, we're born of God. We're new creatures because the flesh doesn't want to act like it's a new creature. So we have to remind ourselves that. That's different than what he's saying. He's saying if you, if, a, if you have genuine faith, you'll just automatically do these things. And I'm saying, well, if you just automatically do those things, well, why would we have to just constantly preach? Now, remember, you're a Christian. You shouldn't be living like that anymore. The reason we got to preach that is because people still are living that way. And so uh, it's ridiculous some of the scripture uh, verses that are used here. Did I read verse 12 too? It says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, 
that ye should obey it in the lust thereof, okay? You're going to have to be the one that decides, okay? I should not obey that. I shouldn't do that. Right. Like Paul said, I wrestle between the flesh and the spirit. The things that I want to do, those I don't do. The things that I don't want to do, those are the things I keep doing over and over again. Doesn't mean he's not saved. He never, I don't think Paul ever said, well, I must not be saved because I fell into sin again, you know. I fell into temptation. I must not be saved. That's ridiculous. Okay, so... Uh, so these are the things that he says to start that chapter off. And then he says, here's a list of things that naturally come from a genuine believer. All right, he said those with genuine faith, then he defines that, those who are submitted to the Lordship of Christ. He says they follow Jesus, and then he quotes John 10, 27. We looked at that last week, but let's look at it again. John 10, 27. Again, this is a passage where Jesus was talking to Jews, and there were certain Jews, mainly the Pharisees, who did not want to receive him as the Messiah, the promised Messiah that was supposed to come. They didn't want to receive that. And so they asked him about him pre 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 uh, preaching in, uh, what's the word, in uh, parables and stuff like that. And so he, uh, he's questioned about that, and he says, look, some of these people, they're not going to receive me. Right? They're not my sheep, is what he's saying. John 10, verse uh, uh, 27. It says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. But the thing is, he, and he even goes on in this passage and says, he's talking specifically to these Jews right here, and he's saying, if they're my sheep, they're going to follow me. And then he says, I've got sheep of another fold. And, uh, and he says, I, you know, the, these talking about Gentiles. And he's like, I got the sheep of, of another fool. And if you read the entire book of John, I mean, it can't be any clearer that salvation comes through faith alone. Right. Believing in Jesus Christ alone. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, begotten son that whosoever believeth in him. Everybody knows that verse, right? Well, you show me somewhere in John where it says, well, you just repent of your sins. Start living a good life. Read your Bible. Go to church and do all those things. Then you'll be saved. He doesn't say that. He says you have to rely on your faith in Christ. Okay, it's Christ that's going to save you. And so you have to be born again, become his sheep. Right. And, and, and he was talking about people that should have already been believing in him. Jews under the Old Testament already looking for the coming Messiah. And when he shows up, some didn't receive me. He says they didn't receive me because they're not my sheep. Right. And so he's saying that uh, if you believe him, right, if you believe in him, then you are saved. You are his child. And of course, the great verse on eternal security, no man can pluck you out of my father's hand. Nothing in there about you're just naturally just going to do all these great works and, you know, there will be a radical change in you. That's not, that's not what he's saying. Okay, so uh, here's the list that he gives, though. Then he begins to say, here are the things that a genuine Christian will do, a genuine believer. They will love their brothers. So there you go. If you got a brother and you don't love them, you're not saved, <laughs> according to this guy. All right, they'll love their brothers. You know, I guess he has to define brothers because I bet you no matter who it is that's claiming this, if you, well, if you don't love your brother, then you're not saved. I bet you there's somebody out there who at least claims to be his brother in Christ who he doesn't love. <laughs> All right, so here's the problem. He gets this from 1 John. This is why I had Brother Justin read 1 John because uh, if you can take anything out of 1 John, it could be really confusing to you unless you get the context of 1 John. 1 John, I admit, has got some verses in there that make it sound like, man, if you don't keep the commandments, you're not saved. If you don't love your brother, you're not saved. If you don't love God with all your heart, you're not saved. And you start reading some of these and think, oh, no. <laughs> You know, as a kid, I remember reading some of those verses and saying, maybe I misunderstand some things. Somebody explain this to me. But then when you go back and read it in its context, look at chapter 1. Right? Because he quotes 1 John chapter 3. Well, first, uh, chapter 3 comes after chapter 2 and chapter 1. Okay, so let's go see what those say. Chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have handled of the word of life, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life. What's he talking about? Jesus. I show you this is eternal life. Je this Jesus that we're preaching to you, that we saw, 
we witnessed and we're preaching to you him that he is eternal life. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life, right? And so he's saying this is eternal life, which uh, was with the Father and was manifest unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you. Here we go. This is what the, the book of first, the letter of first John is all about. That your joy may be full. Have you ever met a Christian who is just miserable and doesn't have joy? Yeah, that doesn't mean that they're not saved, but their joy is not full. There's something missing. There's something lacking because they're not living for the Lord. They're like a rebellious child going away from him and he's chastening them and all these things. And they're not fruitful. They're not productive. They're not producing fruit for the Lord. And so, uh, so these things write, I unto you that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. You're like, uh-oh. So if, I, so if I say I'm in the light and I mess up, da, da, da. but if you walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You see the word over and over, fellowship, fellowship, fellowship. Do you think somebody can be somebody's son and not have fellowship with them? <laughs> Could my kids ever get to a point where I kicked them out of the house and say, you know what, as long as you're going to live like that and act like that, be like that, I'm not going to talk to you. But they're still my children? Yes. And it's very possible for a Christian who's born again to act as, some, act as somebody who's an embarrassment to Christ and, uh, and, and he's just, he does not have fellowship with the Lord. Doesn't mean he's not saved. We're talking about the flesh. His spirit is washed in the blood of the Lamb. His, his inner man is saved, but he's walking in the flesh. And God says, as long as you're walking like that, I just don't even want to have fellowship with you right now. I'm not going to answer your prayers. I'm not going to just bless you and let everything in your life just you know, like have a life of peace and all that. No, I want you to suffer until you come back to me, and then our fellowship can be restored. Amen. And here's an example of that. You keep on reading. He says, if we conf uh, see, verse 8, if we say we have no sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. <laughs> well, well, how could somebody say, you know, well, if you're a Christian? I, I mean, I realize that they're, they're going to they're gonna double speak. Like I said, that, that sometimes their wording, I, I think they're just, sent, they're really like confused, a lot of these guys. They just don't understand. Like, I want to believe it's all grace, and it's just by having faith in the Lord. But then I also think you got to do the works. And so they're just kind of confused. And so sometimes they speak out of both sides and, and, of their mouth. But here's what he says. He says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Right. That's where lordship salvation has to, it has to lead somebody to the point where they say, I'm not in sin. I mean, I'm perfected in Christ, and, 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 and because I'm his elect, and he has given me, uh, you know, he's not only predestined me, but he sanctified me and all that, and so look, I'm perfected. I mean, it has to lead to that point where they believe that, and then they start looking down on anyone who's not reached that point that they are, and like I said before, that's hypocrisy, right? He says, you deceive yourself if you don't think there's sin in you, but look, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all, right, all unrighteousness. He's talking to believers. But He's saying, look, believer, when you sin and, and you lose your fellowship with God, you can restore that fellowship by confessing your sins and getting them right. That's not salvation. He's talking about fellowship with the Lord. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So it's funny because now you keep on reading the rest, and, and, and sometimes there are words, there are phrases that sound like, well, if you're really a Christian, you'll live for the Lord. If, you're, if you say you're a Christian and you have sin, you're a liar. But then it'll say, but if you sin, <laughs> right? I mean, I'm just over and over as you read this, it's going back and forth because you have to look at it from the perspective of, you know, I'm saved. I just need to make sure I'm, I'm walking in fellowship with the Father, most importantly, and then also with one another in the church. There's even a place where you break fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ because they're saying, hey, our fellowship is with Christ. And if you're not going to fellowship with, with us, right, then you have to be held at arm's length until you come back and then we can receive you. And I mean, that's just all throughout the Bible. 
So the Bible uh, says, look at John 4. Here's another one that he quotes in that article, John 4. Notice this is the same author, right, that wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. And also wrote the Gospel of John where it just says, believe, 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 believe. I mean, that's how it talks about being saved is believing in Jesus Christ. And John uh, chapter 4, look at verse 11. Oh, that's not right. Let me see here. I've got the article. I don't even know what what I did here. <coughs> da, 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 da. I don't know where I got that, but that's not on there. <laughs> so never mind that. All right, let's go on to the next one. I don't know what I did there. So here's what it says. You'll love your brothers if you have genuine faith. Number two, you'll obey God's commands. Back to 1 John 3. I'm putting you on a wild goose chase here. Back to 1 John chapter 2. Okay, it was 1 John 4.11. Sorry, that's what happened. 1 John 4.11, let's read that first. He goes back and forth between John and 1 John, so I got confused. It says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And I agree, we ought to. <laughs> It says right there, we ought to love one another, implying that, you know, some people aren't going to, but we ought to. We've got to remind ourselves that we're Christians and we're supposed to love the brethren. Okay. Anyway, now let's look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. He says that you will obey God's commands. 1 John 2, 3. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. So this is the confusion. You knock on someone's door, you know, do you know for sure you're saved? Oh, yeah. Well, what do you got to do to be saved? Keep all the commandments. You telling me that you keep all the commandments? Well, no. <laughs> you can't have it both ways. Well, the Bible says you got to keep the commandments. Well, that's, that's true. That's the, that's the law. That's what God wants us to do. But we all fall short of that. And we don't just, when we get saved, just all of a sudden, now we can keep all the commandments. That doesn't happen. Well, then how do you explain what he's saying here in, in 1 John? He says, uh, He that saith, I know him, and keep not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whosoever keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God. Look, perfected. All right? We're constantly working towards perfection. Jesus said, Be ye perfect. Anybody reach that state yet? <laughs> We're working towards it, but not because, I mean, that's not just what the, the automatic fruit of salvation. That's what we need to do because we're saved, and we need to tr start working towards that. But then he, it's funny because then he keeps on going here, and, and again, he's, he'll start saying, but if you sin, you know, come back. So, so it's not like everybody is going to keep the commandments. He's just saying that that's what you ought to do. That's what you need to do is keep the commandments. You need to restore fellowship with the Lord. You need to try to be fruitful and all these kinds of things. Now, this time it is John. I know because 1 John doesn't have 15 chapters in it. John chapter 15. John chapter 15 and verse 14. This is Jesus talking to the disciples and he says, Ye are my friends. If you do whatsoever, I command you. Well, let me ask you this. Does being a friend, is that a requirement for any earthly relationship? I mean, I should be a friend to my wife. We have a lot better relationship whenever I'm friendly with her. <laughs> right? If I'm her friend, I'll treat her a certain way. But does that mean if all of a sudden one day I come in and I'm not friendly with her that we're not married anymore? No. If my children, again, they should respect me. But if they come in one day and they disrespect me, I guess they're not my children anymore. No, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he says, you're my friends if you do what I've told you. He's not saying you're saved, but only if you do whatever I tell you to. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, you're my friends. You're, you're following me. You're truly following me. You're true disciples 
if you keep my commandments. He's not saying that that is the basis of whether or not somebody is saved. John is the same author that used the word believe over 90 times in the, in the Gospel of John to say this is the requirement for salvation, that you believe in Jesus. And John lists several times of people that would follow Jesus and they believed in Jesus, but they weren't his disciples. He would treat his disciples separately. He would take them with him. It doesn't mean only those disciples are going to heaven. It's just saying that these were the ones that were following him and they were willing to suffer and they were willing to take up their cross and all these kinds of things. And look, even the disciples messed up quite a bit, don't you think? <laughs> so, uh, so nobody is perfectly keeping all the commandments. But he's saying, that, hey, if you're, you're my friend, you're my disciple, if you do these things. Number three, uh, he says this. He says that a, true, a person that has genuine faith will do the will of God. Matthew chapter 12 is what he, is what he points to. Let's look at Matthew 12. Here's what he says at the end of that chapter. He says, For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. And so he's using that verse to say, look, if you're, if you're really a believer, if, you're, if you have genuine faith, you're going to do the will of the Father. Well, here's what Jesus said is the will of the Father. John 6, 40 says, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have eternal life, and I will raise him up the last day. <laughs> so yes, if you want to be saved, you've got to do the will of the Father. What's the will of the Father? Believe in my Son. Amen. doesn't say you've got to do the works. doesn't say you've got to be you know, a, a wonderful disciple of Christ. That's not, a, that's not a condition for your salvation. There's only one condition for salvation, and that is, I can't get there on my own. Oh, Jesus paid the price for me? Free gift of salvation? I accept. <laughs> Amen. Oh, that's too simple. Well, if you think that's too simple, you're not going to heaven. <laughs> because if it's faith plus works, that's right. you just, you just disannul faith. Faith doesn't mean anything anymore because you're trusting in your works. And, Jesus, and God says, okay, you want to be tried by your works? Well, you just wait till judgment day, stand before God and say, judge me by my works, Lord. Look how good of a Christian I am. Right. He's going to say, I never knew you. That's right. yep. But for those who say, you know, I've tried to serve you, but I fail all the time. You know, yeah. I'm getting in based on what Jesus did for me. And he says, well, welcome in. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You've got the, you got the wedding garment. You've got the white robe that Jesus paid for with his blood. Amen. Amen. Okay. Then he says this, he says, those who have genuine faith, you know, this is all these are, are under that same category there. They will abide in God's word. And he looks at any, any references, John chapter eight. John eight. Verse 36. No, I'm sorry. John 8, verse 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. But here's the thing. Not everyone that believes is a disciple. That's right. They should be a disciple. They should follow the Lord. It's only... Their reasonable service is that they would give unto the one who paid it all, paid all their way for salvation. Now, look, we can never pay Jesus back for what he did. You know, I just told a guy today, as I often say, if you've ever been soul winning with me, I probably said it to somebody. I said, if somebody said, you have to, if you want to join this club, if you want to be a member of this club, then you have to pay a million dollars. I can't do it. I need somebody who's really, really wealthy to say, I'll pay your way. You know, I could never pay him back for that. It's not like, hey, can you, can you spare me a million dollars? I'll pay it back later, I promise. <laughs> you know what I mean? No. 
But I would say, hey, I'm pretty grateful for that guy for paying my way. Don't you think I ought to respect him and, and try to honor him and, and serve him? But look, it wasn't a conditional thing. Jesus paid the price for our salvation. And it's not a the way we live for him is not a matter of our salvation. It's just what we should do. It's our reasonable duty. Amen. <clears throat> but unfortunately, not everybody will do that. But here he's talking to these Jews, and many of these Jews believed Right, but not all of them were his disciples. He said, uh, uh, "What did he say? If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples." Uh, so here's what he says, uh, very closely related to. Oh, let me say here. Okay, in this passage, let me let me give you this. There are three groups, and there's always going to be these three groups. Okay, in this context, you read this chapter. Here's who he's talking to. There is one group of people who are not believers. These people are lost. He's trying to give. He's trying to show them that if they'll if they'll trust him, receive him, then they'll be saved. But there's a group of people he's talking to who are lost. Some are are permanent lost. Some are reprobate, <laughs> right? Some of those people that followed him around and were just trying to trip him up and find a reason to get him. They they rejected him. Okay, they didn't receive him as the Messiah. And God hardened their hearts. The Bible makes that really clear. Okay, but there's a second group, and that group were those people who believed. And for the most part, they would follow him. They believed him. They believed in what he could do. You know, they put their trust in him uh, as the Messiah. And uh, they saw his miracles and all that kind of stuff, and they followed him. This would be, they would have called oftentimes in the Bible the multitude, of the multitude of them that believed, all right? They, they actually believed him. But then uh, they didn't all, they weren't all disciples, though. See, the third group is the disciples. This was a close group. Now, primarily when we say disciples, we're talking about the 12, minus Judas, of course, uh, who was a false prophet. Also, there was a time where he had 70 people that he sent out. And other times there were a little bit bigger group of people that he called disciples. But most of the time he's only running around with, t with 12 guys. Are these the only Jews that were saved? No, because right here in his context, he says the, these that believed. And Jesus promised those who believe in me, I'll give them eternal life. And so he's saying these that believed, but then he's referencing another group of people that are his disciples. Okay, so there's three different groups of people. It's not like, I mean, because I have actually heard people say there's no difference between a, a believer and a disciple. Like if you're a believer, you're a disciple. Well, you got a lot of explaining to do because there's a lot of verses in there that talk about people that didn't want to join and do those things, but they still believed on him. And so, uh, and so anyway, very closely related to that, he says that they will not only abide in God's word, it says that they'll keep God's word. And that's John 17 that he references. John 17, verse 6. Again, these are just all verses that you'll hear thrown out at you every once in a while. If, if they want to accuse you of easy believism and you say, what are you talking about there? Gospel is, is pretty simple, plan of salvation, right? And they'll still... Yeah, but you got to do these, and you got you know if you really believe them, then you're going to do these things. This is what they'll often throw out at you. Uh, let me see here. What did I say? John 17, verse six. He says he's he's praying to the Father. Jesus is praying to the Father. He says, "I have manifested Thy name unto the men which Thou givest me, out of the world. Thine they are, and Thou gavest them me." And they have kept thy word. And so who's he talking about right there? I mean, he's talking about his disciples. He said, you gave them to me. They've been following me. Because remember, elsewhere he says this, except the one, the son of perdition. Right? That's the only one that, you know, that followed me who, who I wasn't able to keep because he never was saved. All right? But he's talking about his disciples right there. And look, are those 11 because obviously Judas, Judas didn't go to heaven. Are those 11 the only ones that went to heaven? No. He's talking about these disciples, and he says, and they've kept my word. And like I said, even the disciples, you know, you look at the way that they lived. They got into the flesh a lot. They had doubts. You know, they quit on, they quit on, how about Peter, man? He, he just denied Christ at one point, yet he was still saved. He, uh, now I've heard some say that he wasn't at that point, but he denied Christ. And he, how about when he goes back fishing, right? It's not like he wasn't saved. He was already trusting in Jesus as the Messiah. And if he was just confused, he had doubts and Christians can have doubts. It doesn't mean that they're not 
uh, they're not saved. But even that, he's just specifically talking about his disciples and, he, and he's praying for them and he's saying, Lord, I'm not telling you to take them out of the world. I know they got to be in the world. I'm just telling that you protect them and all. And so he's praying for them. I don't, I don't know why you'd bring that verse up and say that if you're genuine faith, you know, then you are just going to uh, 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 keep all God's words. And then moving on right here to uh, number six, he says that the, those who have genuine faith will do good works. And then he goes to Ephesians 2.10. <laughs> Skip right over it. Eight and nine, I guess. Oops. Ephesians 2. Let's skip over 8 and 9 and go straight to verse 10. <laughs> For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we, what's the next word? Should, should walk in them. He's working on us. You ever heard that song, kids? You sing, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Yeah, but you know what? That doesn't mean it's always going to look the same with every person. That doesn't mean that everybody is going to be just naturally doing good works. Somebody can be saved, and it might be a long time before you ever see them doing good works. I've heard a lot of stories where it just, they say, ah, you know what? Years and years and years. I got saved. Satan began to just tempt me, and trials came my way, and so I just, I totally just rejected and, uh, and rebelled. And uh, I knew in my heart I was saved, is what they'll say. I believed in Jesus. I knew in my heart I was saved, but I just wanted to live like the devil and whatever. And so then all of a sudden one day, in many cases, they say, then I came back and, and uh, God was still working on me. And, but you know what? What if he died before that day? What if his life got so bad, God just took him out? Did he lose his salvation? No, we know he can't lose salvation. And the funny thing is, I would say 90% of these guys that teach Lordship Salvation will tell you that they believe in uh the perseverance of the saints. I think uh, on the video, last time I said, uh, I meant to say perseverance of the saints when I said preservation of the saints. And somebody said, no, 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 preservation is different, man. We once saved, always saved, but perseverance of the saints is a false doctrine. Well, basically, those who are following Christ, you know, that is, is our only perseverance, you know, is, and, and the fact that he's going to preserve us until uh, the day of redemption, right? We're going to be saved. That doesn't mean that we're just naturally going to do all the works. It's, in other words, here's what I'm saying. It's not like, it's not like, okay, well, maybe they're a little slow to do the works, but if they're really saved, then one day they're going to do the works. Well, not necessarily. You know, I think a lot of people are just going to stand before God empty-handed and go into the millennium with no rewards, right? But the Bible makes it very clear that they themselves shall be saved, okay, yet as by fire. And so, uh, so it's... Uh, true that we should do good works. It's true that we are his workmanship and he's trying to mold us and he's trying to make us into the, the Christ-like people that we ought to be. But we can't make someone else's life, if it doesn't compare to where we are, the basis of whether or not they're saved. Right. We can't, whatever our expectations are like, well, how do you define good works? Well, they got to do this, they got to do that, gotta do, you see what I'm saying? Who's going to be the judge of that? We're his, his workmanship, but look, some people, some clay is hard to mold. <laughs> some clay just doesn't want to cooperate with you, okay? And he's not going to force that. That's, that's where some of this gets into Calvinism. Typically, these Lordship Salvation people, if they're not Calvinists, they're like right there, okay? Because they're believing, well, God's just naturally going to do it within you. You don't really have a choice. Well, that's not true. We can fight against God until the day we die, but if we received him for the salvation of our soul, look, I know a lot of people are not living for the Lord, and they say, I know I'm saved. I received Jesus, right? I don't know how God's going to deal in their heart. I don't know how God's going to chasten them for not living for him the way that they should have. You know, they're definitely not bearing fruit, probably going to, uh, you know, have to give an account in some way for all the people that they should have been leading to the Lord and instead they turned them away because of their lifestyle or something. I don't know how God's going to judge all that, but look, when we're talking about somebody's salvation, what am I going to say? Well, we got to wait and see your fruit to know if you're saved or not. That's ridiculous. Right? That's a works-based salvation, and so we can't re rely on that. So yes, we are supposed to do good works, 
But that doesn't mean, well, if you're a genuine faith, I'll see your works. Well, who's going to define it? I mean, <laughs> that's ridiculous. There's a lot of people that do good works who are lost as can be, but they still know how to do good works. So, so you can't make a basis off what you think somebody's life ought to look like, whether or not they're saved. That's ridiculous. Right. He says this also. He says that they'll continue in the faith. Okay, that's what, that would be the uh, perseverance of the saints. Okay. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1 verse 21. It says, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unprovable in his sight. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. And he goes on. Paul's notorious for writing run-on sentences. But here's the thing. Paul is hoping to present these people that he's preaching to. This is his labor of love. He's investing into these people. They've been saved, but now he's trying to show them how to walk in the new man. Okay, And he's saying, I want to present them as someone who's fruitful. I want to present them as somebody who's unblameable and unreprovable and present them to the Lord that way. He's not saying that they're already there or that they're naturally going to be there. He's saying, I'm working to get them to that point. That's what I'm trying to do. That's why I'm preaching the gospel to them. That's why I'm praying, I mean, not the gospel, I'm preaching uh, against sin, and I'm praying that God will protect them and all that stuff. But the thing is, look at verse 9. So we're Colossians 1, verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, uh, before, uh, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. He's saying, look, I want you, I want you to grow in knowledge. I want you to add to your faith, you know, so that I can present you blameless and all these kinds of things. And so... Uh, verse 22 there, what's he say? Uh, blame, uh, unreprovable and unblameable, okay? He, he, that's the way we should be presented, and that's the way Christ wants us to be. Uh, and then he also quotes uh, Hebrews chapter 3. This is the last one. Hebrews chapter 3. In verse 14, again, he's saying that those who have genuine faith will continue in the faith. And he quotes uh, Hebrews 3 and verse 14 says this, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Okay? And uh, if you look at everything that he's saying here, he's, he's actually making a comparison in this passage. Let's, let me just read this. Verse, uh, verse 1 there says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as... He who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. I love that verse, which is that verse is a good, uh, good way to show that Jesus is saying he's God. He's the creator, right? He's, uh, uh, he's, more, he's higher than Moses, as is a person who built the house is higher than, than the house. Verse 4, for every house is built upon some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house uh, are we, if we hold fast the confidence uh, and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost say, uh, uh, saith, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the day of temptation. 
uh, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years, wherefore I was grieved with the gener- with that generation, and said, uh, they do always err in their heart, and have and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any, uh, in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of your sin. So uh, a couple more verses. Let's keep reading. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Whilst it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt uh, by Moses, but with whom uh, was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcass fell in the wilderness, and to whom swear he uh, that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Now, he's using this great story from the Old Testament. And he's talking about the children of Israel who he was taking out of, the, of, of bondage and slavery. And he was saying, hey, you're going to go into the promised land. And then they rejected him, hardened their hearts, and they murmured and complained and all that. And so what did God do? He allowed them to have to wander around for 40 years and 40 nights. 40 years and 40 nights. <laughs> for 40 years. The other day, it was funny because the other day I was saying Jesus was tempted, uh, you know, for 40 days and 40 nights. And then somewhere in the message I said he was tempted for 40 years. <laughs> I was like, wow, man, that's a long temptation. No, I know he fasted. I said that's what he He had fasted for 40 years. And I'm thinking, wow, man, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> he could have done it, even though he died in 33. But how does that? <laughs> okay, anyway, I, I, I digress. Okay. So here's the story. He's talking about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. And he said they did not get to go into the to rest. The promise that he had for them, which was what? The promised land. Let me ask you this question. Did Moses get to go into the promised land? No. Was Moses saved? <laughs> did, all, did, did all the other, did anyone else except for the two spies and their gener, future generation get to go into the land? No. So were, the only, were, were only the two spies the only ones that were saved? No. See, he's just using a story, and he's saying, look, you need to endure like the children of Israel. When they didn't endure and just follow the Lord by faith and accept his word, you know, then God caused them to have to wander around for 40 years, and he said they didn't even get to go enter into the rest. right? But he's not saying, you know, so look, if you just fall away, then you don't have salvation. Right? And he's certainly not saying, if you believe and then you fall away, now you lost your salvation. He's not saying that. He's just saying you need to keep following the Lord in faith. Keep doing what he's told you to do. And, uh, and he's telling him, he's exhorting him to continue in Christ in order to have what's best for their lives. This is what God wants. And this is why he chastens his children. He wants what's best for you. But you have the opportunity to refuse that. My children, I understand the verse, train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. But guess what? There are people that do all that they can, set the rules, try to raise their children right, try to instill good uh, godly morals, and they've done the best that they can do. I mean, obviously they've fallen short because we all err, err, but the children still end up rebelling. You can't make somebody to, uh, uh, to do right. But, you know... God will continue to discipline, continue to chasten, continue to... I don't believe that a, a, a Christian can just naturally just go along living life however they want to, doing what's right in their own eyes and committing all kinds of sin. And I can go testimony after testimony, even in this room, where they say, nope, God's not going to let you do that. If you're saved, He's going to keep whipping up on you and you're going to know, I'm going to get the chastening hand of God. I'm going to get the chastening hand of God. But you can still continue to rebel against that. You can still mess up your life. You can still do all manner of evil, right? So we can't look at somebody and say, well, man, they're just, 
They're just not living the way that they should be living, so they didn't get saved. And that is in a nutshell what Lordship Salvation teaches. And I know they'll sometimes play a word game or throw some straw men out there. Sometimes we'll throw straw men out there too because we don't really know what it is, what it is they're believing. Okay, but in essence, the Lordship Salvation is saying you've got to totally be committed to Christ. And if you're totally committed to Christ, then naturally, you know, he's going to make sure that you'll do the works. And so if you go out there and preach the gospel and somebody just says, yes, I believe that. And they say a prayer and then you walk away and say they got saved. You know, you just made them twofold to try to. I don't. How? How? How have you done that by preaching the gospel? And they said, I believe that doesn't make any sense. OK, but on the other hand, the other end of the spectrum is this person says, well, yeah, I believe the gospel. And he doesn't say anything else except for, well, great, go do the works, live for the Lord, read your Bible and all that. And now this person gets confused and says, hmm, I guess I got to be a good person or else I can't get to heaven. So who's the one that's making someone twofold the children of hell? That's right. right? The Lordship Salvation crowd. Yep. Yep. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your clear presentation of uh, the gospel in the Bible and the clear uh, uh, affirmation that we have that we can have eternal life through Jesus Christ and no other way can we have it Lord I know it's hard for some people to understand because they are so conditioned to believe uh, that being good is a part of our salvation Lord help us to make the gospel clear that others might realize they can't be good they can't be good enough nothing they can do to uh, impress you or please you and help us just to make them realize that the only chance they have of going to heaven uh, and security that they can have uh, to know that they're going to heaven is by choosing to put their faith in you. And Lord, uh, I pray that you will help us never to get discouraged, but to keep on doing that boldly, no matter what uh, some might say or do to try to discourage us from, uh, from preaching that clear salvation message. And I pray, Lord, that you just bless the efforts and the fruit that comes from that. I do uh, pray that you help us to know how to minister and to encourage and exhort some of these folks that got saved that they might live for you and, uh, and that we would preach boldly against sin and, and wickedness and, and point people to, uh, to walk with you and have a better fellowship with you. And uh, just uh, uh, be with us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.